Good morning, God's peace. Let's begin this service with singing number 112, Praise the Savior. Welcome everyone to our service this morning. Special welcome to all our visitors and online guests. We thank God for this opportunity to worship and fellowship together around his word. We welcome you to join us often. The cleaning committee would like to remind everyone to check the lost and found and claim any items prior to April 30th. This morning there'll be a baptism for Chase Gary Matson, son of Steve and Bethany. The schedule this week is Wednesday Bible study at 7 p.m. Next Sunday, Sunday school at 9.30 a.m., worship service at 10.30 a.m., and an afternoon service at 1.30 p.m. Today, there'll be an evening service at 7 p.m. Let's continue now with singing 123, The Strife Is Over.
Good morning and God's peace. I uh, took a couple notes on this Psalm 4 that I'm going to read this morning. It's just on, mainly on some of the words that are in it. Um, that David probably wrote this psalm when he was being pursued by Saul. When or afterwards. He was being pursued through the wilderness like a wild animal and in despairing often for his life. But um, in this psalm, the first verse says that thou hast enlarged me. That word enlarged often means kind of made larger or like prospered. or, But in this case, I guess it is more like set free. Like in, in his distresses, pursued so tightly, and yet he found God had, had brought him through it all and kept setting him free from every snare that Saul's and his henchmen would set. And in uh, verse 2, it talks about uh, how long will you love vanity and seek after leasing. That word vanity is often about um, idol worship, idol doctrines, false prophecies, just, just lies and stuff. And leasing actually means lies. How long will you seek after lies? But it's, it's, it's uh, promises, false promises to those going in an evil way perhaps that are empty compared to God's promises that are solid and never change. And they're true. And uh, anyway, I was thinking about it that um, perhaps some of this, the idle lies were, were, could also be political advantage that you see. What it was a doeg, the, um, I forget what tribe he was. I think it was a pagan tribe, but. But when he was turning David in, looking for political advantage that is only temporary and false when he is going against God's anointed. In verse 4, he says, stand in awe and sin not. And that awe is like terror. Like if somebody were pursuing David and running after him through the wilderness, we were to suddenly come up to the edge of a cliff. Maybe a terror akin to that. It should be even more, considering that David's help was only a prayer away. The Almighty Creator who created heaven and earth and, and all things, and whose every heartbeat of ours is in his, in his hands. And he's only a, a prayer away for us, too, when we're troubled, when it seems like Satan's pursuing us or our families. He's only a prayer away. And he cares for us and our children and our church more than we could ever care. And, and we care so much for our kids and hopefully for our brothers and sisters in faith too. So anyway, we'll now read Psalm 4 in Jesus' name. It says, Hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. O ye sons of men, how long will ye turn my glory into shame? How long will ye love vanity and seek after leasing? But know that the Lord hath set him apart that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Stand in awe and sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. There be many that say, Who will shew us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. Thou hast put gladness in my heart more than in the time that their corn and their wine increased. I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. For thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Amen. Shall we pray? And dear Heavenly Father, we want to praise your holy name for all the goodness that you've shown towards us, who in ourselves are but sinners, rebellious, often erring, 
and yet you have called us unto yourself. You showed us your son, Jesus Christ. You've allowed your glorious gospel to be preached to us of what you have done to redeem us through your son's own blood, that you were in Christ, reconciling the world unto yourself, not imputing our sins unto us. Lord, it will take all eternity to praise your holy name and thank you from all for all that you do for us that are beyond numbering or counting. And we thank you that you care for our children, for all of our young people, and for us getting older people and our elderly as we go through this world, that you, that you care for, for every step. Not a hair falls from our heads, but that you know it. And this you have prepared an eternity for us that is beyond any description. That, that your Bible, your word, tells us of. And yet we know that experiencing it is something that even our little minds could not, could not handle knowing probably. But we still want to praise and thank you. And Lord, we pray that you would be with Paul, fill him with the Holy Spirit for, for his task here and, and baptizing another young one in your, your holy, blessed name. We pray that you be with Phil, fill him with the Holy Spirit for preaching and teaching from your word, that he can do it clearly with boldness, even as the Apostle Paul asked for. And that we would have hearing ears and understanding hearts and could grow thereby. And that we could carry your word with us as we go through this dark world. Guide our government. Help them to do what's right. Help them to remember their vows to serve the people. And now, Lord, hear us as we pray together that perfect prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. But give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Now for the scripture after prayer is uh, Luke 24, uh, 36 to the end. No, 36 through 49. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, and it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. Amen. And the song is uh, 133, Jesus the very thought of thee.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, the Word of God teaches us, teaches us that all mankind, by the fall of Adam, come under the power of sin, death, and the devil. But our Lord Jesus Christ has redeemed us with his precious blood and atoning death. Therefore, in obedience to his commandment, let us assist Chase to become a partaker of this, his holy baptism, praying that the Lord Jesus will keep him in faith all the days of his life. For as much as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and thus death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. So by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. By nature, we are all therefore the children of wrath, and have come short of the glory of God. But as through one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so through the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. For as sin reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. It is therefore most meet and right that in obedience to his commandment and trusting in his promises, we bring our children to be baptized in the name of the triune God. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ has himself instituted holy baptism, saying to his disciples, All power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And that's in Matthew 28 chapter. This comforting gospel from the 10th chapter of St. Mark assures us that God hears our prayers and graciously receives children. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us hear the Christian faith that our church confesses, and to which ch this child is to be baptized. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born to the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I baptize thee, Chase Gary, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and ever henceforth. Amen. Let us give thanks and pray. O innocent Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, Thou who lovest children and therefore bade them come unto Thee, Thou who placed the hands upon them and blessed them, saying, Theirs is the kingdom of God. We pray thee, look graciously upon Chase, who also needs thy holy blessing, that as he has been baptized in thy holy name with water and the Holy Ghost, he also, by the same Spirit, may prosper and grow, and be filled with all good gifts to thy honor and glory, thou who reigneth with God the Father and the Holy Ghost, world without end. Amen. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, 
You are our witnesses that this child has been baptized in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Therefore I exhort you, parents and godparents, early to teach this child to keep that which our Lord Jesus Christ in his word has commanded us, so that he may grow in the grace and knowledge of God and our Redeemer Jesus Christ, abiding in this covenant, wherein the triune God in his grace has received him through the merits of Jesus Christ our Lord. To that end, may God give you his grace. Amen. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into his death, that like as Christ is raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The peace of God be with you. Amen. Now let us join our hearts and our voices in singing 420, Blessed Assurance. 420.
grace to you and peace from God the Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text this morning is found in the first epistle of John, beginning with verse, chapter 2, verse 28, and reading through 310. It's 1 John, chapter 2, 28. And we read in Jesus' name. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that Jesus, or that he, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Amen. The apostle instructs us to abide in the Lord. Brother Will read from the gospel text for this Sunday how Jesus left his disciples there. The disciples were wondering probably what is going to happen to them. But we now live in the hope of the resurrection and in that we abide. There we find our peace and our comfort our solace in times of trouble. And that's where we find the Apostle John writing to his little children. The little children who are awaiting with great expectation as we are for the second coming of the Lord. We live now in that reality of Jesus Christ risen from the dead. This is a beautiful text. Goes without saying, it's from the Word of God. It gives us great comfort, even as we begin, as it is addressed to us as little children. It, it seats us at the feet of Jesus as his children. But at the same time, there are difficult things to understand in this text. Difficulties that we run up against as a Christian, knowing our sinfulness, but yet knowing God's grace in Christ Jesus. Even as we are exhorted earlier in this epistle that if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. But then we read in our text this morning that we do not commit sin if we are in Christ Jesus. And a parent 
contradiction in the word? No, it cannot be. The contradiction or the, the consternation that we may have of reading things like this abides in our hearts, in our minds, and not in the word. So as little children this morning, we will hear what the Lord has to say for us, to us, through John, the beloved apostle. As we begin and now, little children, abide in him. The writings of the apostle John are so reflective of the gospel that he was inspired to write. Even as we read the words of Jesus recorded by John in the 15th chapter of his gospel about abiding in the true vine, this thought, this theme runs through the apostles' writings as we abide in Jesus even as he instructed his disciples and those who were under the hearing of his word to abide or to remain in him. Remain in him that when he shall appear, this is our hope, that when Jesus returns, he will find us not wanting. He will find us not ashamed. He will not find us cowering in fear, wondering, questioning, are we fit, as it were, to see the Savior? But no, rather we would be confident and not be ashamed before him at his coming. The message of the gospel, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto or looking forward to salvation. That's, why, that's how you are kept. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news that although you are a sinner, God's grace in Jesus Christ is far greater than all of your sin. If ye know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. This word doeth here, we run into this a few times in the text. We run into doeth and committeth. There's a few different ways that we could look at this, and we'll probably look at it when we get to those words. But this word can also be um, looked at as one who would commit righteousness. And how do we commit righteousness? If it is indeed committing righteousness, how can we commit righteousness? We know that in the Bible there are different um, meanings behind the word righteousness. The first and the most important is the righteousness that we have, which is of faith in Jesus Christ. That righteousness which accounts us as his children. But as I said earlier, we are now living in the reality of the resurrected Jesus Christ. As he gave his disciples power, that power has also then been given to us in the church that we would abide in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is in that righteousness that we commit or we practice righteous deeds for the benefit of our neighbor to the glory of the Father. If ye know that he is righteous, then everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. John chapter 3. I suppose I wouldn't even have to go to those verses, but John chapter 3. When Jesus appears to Nicodemus, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, ye must be born again. This born again is not just some type of empty title or metaphor, but it is actually the reality of one who is new in Christ Jesus. As Paul writes unto the Corinthians, the second letter, the fifth chapter, that all things are become new. You are a new creation in Jesus Christ. So one who is born in Jesus Christ, born of him, born from above, is indeed a new creature. 
And in this new creation, we live differently than before in dead, deadness of our sins and trespasses. Behold, look around you now. That's what behold means. I have a, I don't know, maybe a, is it a confession? You, you rate that or judge that when I get done speaking about this verse. For years I have looked at this verse as beholding the manner in which God showed his love to us in Jesus Christ. That's John chapter 3, verse 16. God so loved in this manner. But I was very surprised just this week as I read this verse for how many? I could probably say hundreds of times. And I don't believe that's what this verse is saying. As we look around us now in the fellowship of believers, in the context of what John began in the first chapter, the fellowship that we have one with another, where the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness, that's where we are gathered here this morning, in the fellowship of believers. And now we look around about us and we look at the type of love that God has bestowed or has granted or has given you that you should be called a son, a child of God. What type of love is this? That God has given you that you would be called into his fellowship. Reminds me of the song that says that father love is reigning o'er us. Brother love binds man to man. And I believe this is the love that John is writing about here now. It's the agape love, the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts. And now it is manifest or evidenced in love toward our neighbor. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon you, upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. We have been included now in this brotherhood with Jesus Christ who is not ashamed to call us his brother. And in that now, and so we are, and in that now the world does not know us. The world cannot recognize us because it does not know him. How do we know each other? In the fellowship that we have through Jesus Christ. We don't know each other anymore through the flesh, but we know each other through the spirit which God has given us, the spirit which testifies of Jesus Christ. That's the fellowship that we have. And as we can look around now at each other, and we can see that God has loved us to this extent that we can love each other. We love our neighbor. Or you might love me, even though at times I am not very lovable. How is that possible? Other than God has shed his love abroad in our hearts, and then we are empowered, as it were, to love our neighbor as ourself. Beloved. He keeps bringing us back to that. We are loved of God. Those who are loved of God, we are the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that. Here's the glorious hope. We know that when he shall appear, that's his second coming, not as it were with the disciples as they were behind the closed doors for fear of the Jews, but now we wait, looking heavenward. Lift up, your redemption draweth nigh. When he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall be like him in that he is alive forevermore. We shall be righteous as he is righteous. Holy as he is holy. Immortal. All these attributes of God which have been put on us through the atoning work of Jesus, the death on the cross, and his glorious resurrection. Every man that hath this hope, the hope of the resurrection, the hope of eternal life, 
in him purifieth himself even as he that is Jesus is pure. So often we, maybe especially as, as Lutherans, we, we have a, a, a certain, certain um, shyness to approach the area of righteous living. But on the contrary, would we preach something else? Would we just preach that live any way you want? Sin as much as you want because God's grace is greater than our sin. I just said that. Paul asked that rhetorical question two times in the book of Romans and he answers with the resounding, God forbid. We have witnessed one of those reasons even this morning as we've been baptized into Christ and now we walk in the newness of life. And that we would not serve the devil in our sin. God forbid. So the life of a Christian is an amended life, coming from repentance and daily repentance. Every man that hath this hope, the hope of the resurrection, purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Our purification can only be through Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Our life is never removed from Jesus Christ as we abide in him. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. This is one of those verses now, you know, verse 1, we can, we can rest in that, but now we come to a verse like this and wonder, what's he talking about? Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. How much sin in your life, in my life, would condemn us? One little tiny, what we call white lie? Yes, condemned forever. So then, where do we stand? We stand, of course, in the grace of God, that he has poured out his wrath against sin that was rightly due us. He has poured it out upon his son as his son took our sin and nailed it to the cross. But yet we commit sin. We teach our children. We are reminded of it often that we sin much every day and deserve nothing but punishment. So what's John writing about here now? one who doesn't commit sin, and later on, one who commits sin. There's a few different ways we could look at this. One is that in the new man, we cannot sin. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who walk, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. We could look at this verse as one who habitually commits sin. One whose life is, is characterized by his sinful living. Or we could look at it even another way. I think in the context of the fellowship that we have one with another. Jesus gave a great commandment. A great commandment is that you love one another. And if we abide in his love, then we are not committing sin. If we have love for our brethren, sometimes maybe not even evident in our own life, but when you have love for our brethren, love for fellow man, doing that which is right in the sight of God toward our fellow man, we are then not committing sin. We'll get back to that later on in our text. But whosoever committeth sin, whatever this means, this life of sin, whoever commits it, transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sin. Later on in this same chapter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God. We can see the love of God. The love of God was manifest in what? Because he, that is Jesus, laid down his life for us. 
And then in the context of our text, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. In him is no sin. He was tempted in all points as we are, but yet without a sin. Whosoever abideth in him, here's this word abiding again, dwelleth in him, sinneth not. If we are abiding in Jesus, Paul tells us we don't sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth not, or, or sinneth, hath not seen him, neither known him. 1 John 4, verse 12 tells us, No man hath seen God at any time. It seems that John just sort of dropped that out of nowhere. No man hath seen God at any time. What is he saying here? Have any of us seen God? No. How do we serve him then? We are instructed in the word to serve the living God. How do we serve God in whom we have never seen? Beloved, if God so loved us... No, wrong verse. No, well, I will read that. 1 John 4, 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. We have not seen God, but we see God in our brother as we serve him. Verse 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous, even as Jesus is righteous. As his righteousness is imputed, given unto us, then we are empowered, enabled to do righteous acts for the benefit of our brother. He that committeth sin is of the devil. I'm going to read verse 8 and 9 together. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For, the purpose, for this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Here's a juxtaposition. Big word for you there, huh? One over against the other. He that commits sin is of the devil. He is a slave to de the devil. But whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. He is a slave to God. He is freed from sin. Sin no longer hath dominion over you. That's what the Bible tells us. Don't struggle against it. Don't be a slave to sin. Place your life as your life is hid in God, in Christ Jesus. Abide in Him. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. We sing the wonderful hymns of, of, of after Easter, the after Easter hymns that Jesus has destroyed death, hell, and the devil. We ought then to believe it. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And to prove that the devil was destroyed is that Jesus was resurrected from the dead and ultimately returned to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God, making intercession for us. And then we cower and we say, poor little me, I'm all alone here, and the devil is assaulting me. And I preach to myself, whosoever is born of God, whosoever is born from above, Whosoever is born, as we read already, 
is born of him, the one that doeth righteousness, doth not commit sin. His life is not characterized by his sinful acts, but rather that he is a preciously redeemed soul, that his name is written in the Lamb's book of life. His name is etched in the very palms of the Savior. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. We remember Jesus speaking of himself, that unless a kernel of wheat falleth into the ground and die, it abideth alone. Remember the parables of Jesus as the sower would go out to sow the seed, the good seed, which is the word of God. Peter writes of this same seed. First chapter. <clears throat> Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. Here's this same theme again. Unfeigned or unwavering love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and a good seed will produce good fruit. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest. You, dear beloved, saint in Christ Jesus, the children of God, you are manifest. John writes in his, in the 13th chapter, his gospel should be able to recite this. John 13. Well, I'm going to read a couple of verses, actually. John 13, 34, and 35. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. The children of the devil are also manifest. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. And then he explains this. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Oh, that we by God's strength, God's power, as he gives us, through the Holy Spirit, would remain in love, in God's love, showing that love to our brother. That's what Jesus' message was as he left his disciples. First and foremost, that they would preach repentance and remission of sins in my name, beginning here in Jerusalem. And thanks be to God, it continues even unto this day. And then that we would abide in love in Christ's love, even unto his glorious return. In Jesus' name, amen. Dear gracious God, help us, your dear, preciously redeemed yet weak children. Help us to overcome the wiles of the enemy of the soul and that we may love our brother, we may love thee even as your word tells us that you loved us first and therefore then we can love thee and we can love our brother. Dear Father, continue to shower us with your blessings which are motivated by your love toward us, manifested in Jesus who is our love. Help us, dear Father, even unto the end. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. 
The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.
close in the offertory hymn will be 562, Savior, again to thy, to thy dear name. Your free will offering today is for the benefit of the gospel. <laughs> 